Hey folks, Mike Jay here, and uh, I am just about to begin my preparation for my Princes of the Apocalypse game that I am running uh, later today. Uh, I did this last week for my Tomb of Annihilation game, and that was that was fun, and I'm going to hopefully get better at this each time I do it. So uh, I thought we would get started. One thing I'm going to do differently this time is uh, I'm going to, I have my stream chat open right here, and I'm going to keep an eye on it so we can Talk about D&D while we're doing some D&D preparation. Uh, I realized about 30 seconds before I started the stream that I really should have read the adventure more uh, given uh, the direction that things are going to head. Um, but I am terribly, terribly lazy and I didn't do so. So we'll be learning. We'll be learning together as we go. And maybe you, you folks in chat, whoever you are, uh, Maybe you'll uh, you'll help me out a little bit. So uh, I have loaded up the uh, outline for uh, the steps that we take in uh, Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, the book that I'm currently working on, and will uh, have published by uh, certainly by the end of the year, probably by the fall, um, and the one that just finished its Kickstarter a couple weeks ago. Um, this outline is bigger than the one in the original Lazy Dungeon Master, um, mostly because uh, I felt that there were aspects to the original Lazy Dungeon Master checklist that a lot of us do and wasn't really outlined. Um, it wasn't really complete. Um, it's certainly usable, and many people have used it. Many people love it, so that's great. Hi, DM Rocketeer. I hope you know some stuff about Prince of the Apocalypse so you can help me out. And see, look, I'm looking at the chat this time. Um, so eight steps, uh, as you can see outlined here, I hope it looks like it. And um, one of the steps that was not in the original Lazy Dungeon Master, but is in this one that I think is critically important is reviewing the characters. I think it is useful to review the characters every single time we're doing our game prep just to put them in our minds and remember that they are the focus and the focal point for the adventure and not whatever crazy ass story hi terminally nerdy good to see you thanks for coming by um so i have six characters in this campaign this is a friends and family game uh that i run roughly once a month so I usually have to try to cover a lot of ground in each game, and I level them pretty quick. I think I'm going to level them every session. So they're already third level after one session, because I did first and second real quick, and then second and third at the end. And they'll probably go to fourth, um, which might be a little tough, because they're kind of, you know, they get four hours once a month to learn their character, and that could be, that could be hard. Um, let's see how my stream is doing. Warning, keyframe interval too high. Boy, I sure wish I knew something about uh, uh, what that means. I don't know what a keyframe interval is. Oh, well, I hope it works out. Uh, so we have six characters. I, I keep a campaign worksheet, uh, right here. I don't know if you can see that. Oh my God, I can't see my own camera. Uh, yeah, there's a campaign worksheet. This is available on Sly Flourish. Um, I always keep this handy, and that just lets me take notes and write things down. I'm going to be making a much better, me and me and the, the, the folks that are working in Lazy Dungeon Master with me, um, are going to be uh, making a new one of these that I think will be even more useful. Uh, so, uh, who are the characters? Uh, thank you, Trey Kane, for uh, saying that it looks and sounds fine. You're very kind. Uh, Kurig. Kurig is a uh, dwarven cleric, and he's a bounty hunter. He's 100 years old. Uh, he has some ties. I should have written it down better during the game, but he has ties to the fire cult. Uh, I think he was originally, like, he kind of worked with the fire cult and got kicked out. Uh, so he's seen their symbol before. Um, there's Carcass, great name. Uh, Carcass is a, uh, Elven Ranger, uh, and he has a mysterious history and ties to the Earth Cult. I, th I think he specifically held his, um, uh, background. Uh, 
So the fact that he's tied to the Irish cult is going to matter because um, in today's session they are beginning. Um, uh, they're going to return from the Necromancer's Cave and they're going to uh, see the big sinkhole in the center of Red Lark. And down below they're going to find the um, uh, that temple, the Temple of the Floating Stones that's down there. Uh, so there may be connections between Carcass and the... Um, the Black Earth cultists that are down there. Uh, we have Fastine, played by my niece. Uh, she is a uh, half elven druid. Uh, Circle the Moon. She was raised by dragons. She loves. Probably have her tied into the uh, dragon adventure. Uh, an adult's version of Saturday morning cartoons, only not nearly as entertaining. But thank you, Grant, and hello to you. Thank you for coming. You have your own icon. That's pretty cool. I don't have an icon. Um, is the video paused? Is there a problem? I'm hoping it's just you. It looks like it's clean on my end. Uh, raised by dragons. Uh, what did I write here? Uh, she was attacked by uh, ice shield orcs. They were apparently in this adventure. Um, well, I wrote a bunch of notes I don't recognize. Tori Kumater. Oh, she has a pet bear named Kuma. Uh, I think, how did she pick up the bear? Oh yeah, they, they found it in a bandit cave and befriended it. So she's now got uh, a lot of PC deaths, huh? During P Prince of the Apocalypse. I'm going to be throwing the kitchen sink at him, I think. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, Hasir Hasira. Uh, Hasira is a tiefling rogue. That's one that's right now. Um, and she lost. She lost a dancing dagger, which is now the head of um, the spear that uh, the elemental lady has. The air, elemental air. Where is it? It's in the beginning of the book here. Cool thing about these things. I forget the name of that spear. If any of you remember the name of the spear, let me know. I know it's in this book somewhere. Uh, Black Earth, Crushing Wave, Howling Hatred. Uh, Arisi has it. And. The head of wind vane. So already I've got connections to fire, earth, and air. Um, Ganthelgrom. Uh, Uh, is a Goliath bard. Uh, and I don't really have any connections to there. That monk in Sacred Stone Monastery wiped half the party when we were level two. Yeah, Grant, uh, I think that the monastery is higher than level two. I forget what its recommended level is. But I know it's not two. It's like crazy high. Uh, one thing I'm going to do, though, which I didn't do. So I've run this adventure before, but it's been a couple of years. I ran it when it first came out. And I was uh, a different uh, granite. Uh, this is my wife's character, is a Genesi uh, Earth fighter. So we're still kind of figuring out all the connections of the characters, and, and they don't really have deep backgrounds, which is good because um, 
you know, they can sort of learn their characters as they go. They did start at level one. They fought some bandits. They kicked their asses. They got to level two. They went to town. Um, this is the summary of what happened previously. They went to town, met some folks, got some rumors, uh, heard about the Necromancer Cave, decided to go to the Necromancer Cave, fought his undead stuff, fought the Necromancer, went into a secret chamber, and then immediately said, I wonder what his connection is to the uh, Earth stuff. And um, I'm like, there is, or not to the Earth stuff, to the elemental stuff. And I'm like, there is no connection, but I think we're going to make one. So we're going to figure that out in the start. Um, so where will the game start? The game is going to start in the Necromancer's Cave. Um, they're going to discover the book. Um, and in this book is going to be filled with hints and it's going to be hard to decrypt but it contains various secrets and clues so whoever the lore based character is can learn things continually through this book and the book can become a an avenue for them to learn new things as they go this is like a totally cheap trick that like it's, you know, he used this weird ass script and this weird ass thing that it's going to take, you know, could take years to decode. But like, as I'm going, like, you know, you're spending some time in camp and you're looking at that old book event again and you discover a new code and you figure out that it says, you know, Sacred Stone Monastery is tied to the elemental earth thing or that there's actually another layer. So I can then dole out clues, you know, pretty much any time and at will. Uh, on the idea that they're continuing to learn stuff from this book. So um, I think that that will be a powerful aid. Now, at the same time, something exciting needs to happen. Uh, so we're going to jump to our, um, uh, our uh, random encounters as something else is going to wander into the cave, I think. We'll do it nighttime. Uh, seven is bugbears. So what if bugbears, let's see, is there a thing about the bugbears? Uh, why does this not have bugbears listed? Is it, maybe they don't have a special thing. All right, it doesn't look like the bugbears have any tie to an element, so we're going to give them a tie to the element. Uh, air, earth, fire, water, one, two, three, four. Four, water, watery bugbears. Hmm, that's interesting. Pirate, bugbear pirates, maybe? Uh, bugbear pirates, so, oh, and how many was it? Uh, it was 1d3 plus 1. Uh, that's not a lot of bugbears. That would be four bugbears. We'll make them like six bugbears. Uh, and they're going to be tied to, um, uh, where's my map? I've got a map somewhere. Uh, they're going to be tied to River Guard Keep. Uh, and they'll have a map to it. Um, so that will be kind of exciting. Maybe they'll fight with harpoons and stuff. Maybe it's like four bugbears led by uh, one of those watery jerks, water cultists. Right? We have water cultists in the back of the thing here. Where's our monster book? Hey, there's Ogremok. There we go. Uh, da -da. I don't think these guys are all in order. Ah, here we go. Crushing wave. Crushing wave cultists. So there's a reaver. How about a couple of reavers? Uh, four bugbear pirates and reavers. They're examining it because they want the book because they believe the book can tell them more about how to escalate their part of the elemental stuff. So that'd be, that'd be kind of cool. 
Uh, oh, I like your idea. Earth cultists hired bugbear mercenaries to take up the enemy. Yeah, I just rolled randomly and I got water. And that's good because water is one of the only elements that has yet to be touched on. Um, thanks, Dover. I hope you uh, enjoy what you see. Um, they have a map and are looking for the book. That is exactly right. Devil, Devilfish, you and I are thinking exactly the same way. That the... Um, the book is there. They know the necromancer knows more about what's going on with these elemental tombs. They want to go or with the elemental uh, places, and they wanted to go get the book. So the fact that they uh, got there right after the party did, that will be interesting. That is a fun start. So they get the book. They fight the bugbears. That is cool. So now, what scenes will occur? Well, I they might end up going straight uh, to the, uh, to where is it? To Riverguard Keep. Is there a town by, by Riverguard Keep? I thought there was a town near there. Well, I guess Ironford, right? So they maybe they, yeah. I don't know if they want to go straight. I mean, they're, they're actually, where are they? So they're at Red Lark. Um, so I think the map is actually going to be, uh, or anything that, the, the clues will lead them to Ironford rather than going straight to Riverguard Keep. Uh because they should have some fun at a town before they just go marching up. But they might go. Might end up going right to Riverguard. I mean, that speeds things up. And again, I'm trying to run this campaign as fast as possible. Because it's, it's only going to be like 12 sessions. You know, maybe. Uh, we'll see. 12 sessions is like, that's a year. You know, we'll see if I run this whole campaign for a year. Because it's only month, monthly. Four hours. About four hours a week. Four hours per session. 12 sessions. Um... Uh, uh, oh, sorry, I'm reading your tweets. Maybe missing pages of the book on the map lead to the keep. I think about the second half. Yeah, that could be interesting. Uh, yeah. So, what other scenes? Oh, uh, return to Red Lark. To find the... Um, the big pit, right? The sinkhole. I think, I mean, I'm railroading a bit, uh, but I think I'd like to kind of get them to go back to Red Lark because that sinkhole bit will, will, you know, sort of is the next part. So I don't know, other than the fact that these guys are attacking, I don't think that they are going to have any specific clues that go to River Guard. Uh, but they could find out about these guys and at Red Lark after they're done with the pit. So, so my real hope, if I if I have a you know, and this is folly, right? The idea that I know what direction I want them to go is almost a guarantee they're not going to go that way. So I'll be prepared for them not to. But if I have a choice, I would choose that they go to Red Lark to find the sinkhole, and then they go to Ironford, and then they go to Riverguard Keep. That sounds like a good one. Uh, but I would also like to drop some clues to the other uh, places. Um, you know, Feather Spire. Uh, they might uh, isn't there like a sun priest that turns out is actually a fire elemental cultist? Oh, or they might go visit the monks. The very deadly monks that killed Grant's group. So I want to kind of put in clues for that. Um so those are kind of the scenes. Like my, my, my idea is that they go to Red Lark, they go through the sinkhole stuff, they get the elemental earth stuff, and then when they come out, they sort of have possible options. Um, they, they can go to River Guard, uh, they can go to um, the uh, Fire Elemental Priest guy, they can go to Feather Spire, or they can go to the Monk Monastery, and I'm not going to limit them to any one of them. One, so one difference, I, I, the book talks about recommended levels for each of those places being like four, five, six, and seven. And a encounter balance, as we know, is very fuzzy anyway. So what's hard for one person or easy for another really doesn't matter. So I'm treating them all as like the mid tier, you know, like this is all sort of top tier one and tier two places and they can visit them in any order they want. And I can tune the things on the fly so they're not getting their asses kicked if they go to the wrong one. But I'd like to treat all four of the upper level places as, um, you know, they can pick any one they want to go and try them. Um, rather than what I did last time, which is I really only gave them the clues for the next one that was at the right level range for them. 
that was fine, but it's not the way the adventure is written. And I don't think it's, it's not the way I think about D&D &D these days. Um, you know, the difference, a difference of two years of playing D&D &D has shown me that, um, you know, levels are really fuzzy and the world is the way the world is and, and let the players investigate the areas of the world they want. And if we're nice DMs and not killers, we can always kind of tweak things a little bit. You know, it's different if they end up going down into those dungeons. If they decide they're going to head into really dangerous places, I will say, you know, you, you, you wonder what horrors lie below and whether or not you're prepared for it. Yeah, but I'm thinking more sandboxy and player driven rather than, um, you know, I think like I wrote a whole thing and there's a Sly Flourish article about it. All the keys, like keying the dungeons so that you essentially have to go through them in order. And um, I don't think I would do it that same way. I, I don't plan on doing it that way now. In fact, now I think that they can just focus on one thing that they want to do. So, um, so yeah, so secrets and clues. Uh, the secrets and clues are a, so I'm not exactly sure. This is where I should have read things up ahead of time. So secrets and clues are, in my opinion, the most important part of my game prep. Uh, they take the longest uh, to come up with, and they are the most powerful aspects when I actually run a game. Um, so, so one of the secrets, for example, is that member uh, some some townsfolk of Redlark are actually uh, um. There's another one that was important, uh, the Tomb of Moving Stones, right? And there was a there's a group I kind of like the name, the Bringers of Woe. Uh, so they're not exactly assassins, but they're kind of like, you know, these are the, you know, the toughs. They're not toughs. They're they're more than that. Um, they're like the black earth, you know, the black earth equivalent of a special operations group. Um, I mean, cultists, a band of cultists. So the bringers of woe have been wandering around. Um, oh, so this is where I need to read the book. Um, uh, where is it? So these are the temples. So each of the places, one thing I kind of dig about this is that each of the places has a nice write-up about exactly what's going on to each of them. So the Secrets of Sumber Hills is chapter three. Whole thing about the missing delegation. We're gonna get to the delegation. Oh yeah, so we'll, we'll do some secrets about the delegation. Uh, um, the, the ruins were Besselmere, yeah, Besselmere Dwarves. Um, So I, one thing I like about the Deserin Valley is the idea that it's like, well, there's farms and there's, you know, some places up above farms and fishing villages. And then there's crazy places like a Feather Gale Spire or the, the monastery and all that. But then beneath that is this like whole series of dwarven halls that have existed. And they've been down there for hundreds of years. Right. I don't remember exactly how long, um, you know, thousands of years. Um, I don't think it says when the Besselmere dwarves. Uh, um, 
the dwarves created Tier Bessel. So that was a thousand years ago. So those Besselmere dwarves are even um, about 2,000 years ago. Over a thousand years ago. Uh, come to Desmond to seek out ancient Besselmere ruins. Thousand year old. The Besselmere dwarves had discovered even older than their own. And that could be, you know, thousands of years old, right? I mean, I love that. I love the idea that these ruins are just really ancient. I like old things. If you want, like, Sly Flourish's trick to making things fantastic, two, large and old, right? Anything that's really big is pretty fantastic. Giant statues, you know, the face of a huge statue that's carved out of a mountainside. You know, anything big, huge water wheel, right? Anytime you take any normal thing and make it big, it's kind of fantastic. And the other one is make it very, very old. You know, you're looking at these old waterways and you're like, man, these things must be 2,000 years old. Or you get really crazy and be like, it's like a half a million years old. There weren't even people around. And yet something with an intelligent mind built this. That's when you get into your crazy Cthulhu stuff. So big and old are my two favorite tricks. And um, I use them all the time. And it's kind of a cliche, but whatever. Here we are playing D&D. Best one we draw around the ruins even older than theirs. Um, the uh, Tier Bessel. Uh, Cyclopean architecture. Damn right. I love Cyclopean architecture. Um, sorry, I do not like my slashes. Uh, I much prefer line breaks. Oh, look at that. I'm so good at regular expressions. Um, easy to read with line breaks. This one we do is built a strong call to call Tier Bessel. Uh, So four keeps, adventurers, back about 600 years ago, um, adventurers back 4,000 years ago, known as the Knights of the Silver Horn. overrun by orcs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Three more. So the ones I the, the, the ones I really need to get are like how do you get to those strongholds, right? The secrets of the Sumber Hills. So um uh Griffin Trainers, right? Feathergale Spire. Uh the water the Water Davian Aerial Mount Enthusiast. So Griffin Trainers. Griffin trainers from Waterdeep, that sounds innocuous. I'm sure Sly is like, who are these yahoos babbling my chat about Shawshank Redemption D&D? No, that's cool. Yeah, man. I have to scroll back though. Pieces are not playing. I can't think that's it. You should always be. You guys 
Oh man, dog needs to go out. All right, hang on, gotta let the dog out. Dog doesn't cooperate with streaming. I'm coming. Sorry, dog had to pee. I want to read about mine. <laughs> Reading old chats. I'll tell you, the Shawshank Redemption one would be good for Out of the Abyss, where you start off in this place. I always like the idea. One of the things I loved about running Out of the Abyss was I think it was three sessions, and the best item that the group had was a single rusty kobold sword that they had acquired. And they were like, that sword was worth everything to them. And they had like crappy armor forever. It was really kind of fun. And they did that for, I don't know, seven or eight sessions. And then finally they, you know, actually killed, I think some drow, right? And then from the drow, they got like, oh, real, real weapons and armor. Um, uh, let's see, pirates. Uh, uh, the pirates are around. Oh, I shouldn't move my whole laptop, should I? Ooh. Um, Ironford, Womford. Yeah, right. You had a barbarian with a big wooden stick for four sessions. I, I, that's what I think is fun. Is as long as all of the players are on board with the idea of a survival horror version of D and D, where you know you're like, man, how much lantern oil do we have? And we, we got to go find some more mushrooms with water in it because if we don't, we're hosed. That was, you know, I thought part of the fun of that adventure. But everybody kind of has to be on board if they're expecting to be real heroic. You know, that's going to be a problem. Uh, so we have River Guard Keep, uh, the, the idea that pirates, ah, so now what will tie people to the monks? Um, uh, I saw a, um, Mm -hmm. Quietly recruit monsters and kidnap travelers and isolate the miners. Um, so somebody was bringing ale. Um, I thought I saw something. I'm trying to think, like, what are the hooks that bring people? What's the hook that will bring someone to um, Sacred Stone Monastery? Um, I thought there was a nice clue that somebody had. Rumors in Redlark. Uh, Amun merchant heading north on the long road stopped at Thorisk's workshop for a wagon repair. His goods were marked by a strange symbol like a bowl. He paid and talked uh, uh, about a big gathering of druids he was heading to, hoping to sell the kegs of beer and trinkets. Um, if the characters mention Amun merchant to Thorisk, it can get directions to Scarlet Moon Hall. That's not the same place. Scarlet Moon Hall and Sacred Stone Monetary are two different places. Ha, ha, ha. Um, yeah, Scarlet Moon Hall is the fire thing. Uh, and he is pretending to be... Uh, drew to the circle of the Scarlet Moon. All right, so... Um,
there's an actual ambush site. So what ties the ambush site to um, uh, the Sacred Stone Monastery? That's the question I have. Um, they were pretty quiet, if I recall. But you'd like some kind of... You could just mention the place. If I mentioned it, like, oh, we should go check that place out. Um, um, if I recall, Sacred Stone Monastery. Uh, I still don't know exactly what the clue is. Um, I'm serious as the one I've been having. Big cult is buried there. Gold mask. And the head of the knights have heard of them. Yeah, I'm thinking um, that maybe one of the members of the Black Earth cultists has a mask. Um, Similar to the one found on X. So I think I'm going to drop one of those masks. Um, this is, so this is, you know, there've been a lot of complaints about this adventure. And I think that's probably the biggest complaint is exactly what the threads are. And frankly, this is a problem with WotC adventures in general that I've had is what are the threads, right? We need these threads and they don't have to be linear. They can be many threads, uh, but we need something that connects people, people and places together. Right? What's the why? Why would they bother to go to these places? What what things would drop in the way? And these secrets and clues are kind of my way of drawing those threads. And sometimes we have to make them up because I don't know that. The, I mean, I'm not reading the book thoroughly, and I don't think I even read it thoroughly when I ran it the first time, to be honest. Because um, why lie? Uh, but uh, who's the villain at the? Uh, Uh, the Black Earth Priest, uh, Larrick, L-A-R-R-A-K-H. But that's kind of why we do this work, all right? So we have all four of the... Uh, Places are there. So this is a really good set of secrets. And these sets of secrets are probably last for a while. I just have to figure out exactly where to drop them. But the goal is that in this session, I would like the, the players to have enough clues to go, huh, these are these four places. We know where they are, or we know how to get there. And um, which ones do we want to explore? And, you know, that's, that's kind of how this is going to go. Um, so... Uh, yeah, so Grant, I, I, uh, agree that that's why I wrote Fantastic Adventures the way I wrote it, is I wanted you to be able to skim it. That is not the way Wizards Adventures are written. Um, so given that we invest a fair bit of money into them, like these, you know, this book's 50 bucks, I think. Um, yeah, it's $50 retail for, for princes. Uh, I think it is definitely worth reading them all the way through, or... At the very least, reading all of the sections that you plan to be running anytime soon. So like for Temp uh, Tomb of Annihilation, I have read all of the front matter and all of Port Nianzaru and all of the exploration. I have not, I think I've read a good piece of Omu, and, but I haven't read, um, and I read a little bit about the Fane of the Night Serpent, but I haven't read anything about the final dungeon. So, but I'm, I, I, you know, as soon as people are getting close, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to spend whatever it is, two hours reading that section, because I do think it is worth reading a published adventure all the way through. They recommend it. 
And even if you don't run it the way it is, it gives a lot of inspiration. These are, you know, how I enjoy them. I like reading them. Um, and you don't have to read everything, right? But you know, you have to read every single room, but you should have a really good idea like what's going on in these places. Um, yeah, I like the way Tomb of Annihilation is organized as well. Uh, it's a, it's a, it, I think it is the, my favorite of the WotC adventure. No, I still like Cursus Rod best. Cursus Rod is my favorite D&D &D adventure that they published. Tomb of Annihilation, I think a second. And I think I am biased by the fact that I ran a survey recently and that showed that to be the case. That, uh, um, uh, I can, I can show you those results. I think if you want to see them, uh, my Facebook page, it's always dangerous going to Facebook Where are my saved, saved pages. Uh, no, that's not what I wanted. Save. This has been this poll's been going on for a while, so I think I got a lot of data on it. Uh, yeah, so we're in the hundreds of responses, and that is the result of you know look at the bars more than the results. Curse of Strahd is you know, Tomb of Annihilation is sixty percent of Curse of Strahd. It's pretty pretty good, pretty good range there of what the top ones are. And Princes is the third to the bottom, but I like it. You know, it's a good. It's a good book. And like, even if you just say like, to hell with the plot, I'm just going to steal it for dungeons. It's got like 12 dungeons in it, 13 dungeons, something like that. You know, it's really good. Just for the maps, it's really good. So, and it's got a really good intro and a great map. I, I, I think, I don't, yeah, I mean, they're all pretty good, right? I like, I like all of them. Um, but I thought this is, that, that, that one was weird. Uh, I'm going to get off my Facebook page in case anything weird's on there. Uh, go back to the Desert Valley map. Uh, yeah, James James beat me to it. He wrote a really good thing about how to run Curse of Strahd in a single session, and I ran it recently. Um, uh, and uh, I really I really dig it. Um, so I've got my secrets. I think we're good there. Fantastic locations. I don't really have to fill these out, but there's really five. Uh, the sinkhole, uh, Feathergale, um, Scarlet Moon, Scarlet Moon Hall, and River Guard Keep. I'm not going to fill all these out because I've got a whole $50 book filled with descriptions of those places, but that's just kind of the general thing. So I don't really worry about fantastic locations here because uh, they're already in the book. Um, so NPCs, this one's tough because there's a bit of a mystery going on in Red Lark. Uh, I was reading that part earlier today and I think it's important to um, remember some of the NPCs. How am I in time? I got about 14 minutes left. Um, and uh, where is it? There's like, who are the townsfolk that, um, here we go. So page 156 has a whole bunch of the believers. So the believers, right? And these are Black Earth cultists. Uh, and they include um, Arthur Hatherhand, Elmeth Whalver, 
Um, and I started this one with a execution and I don't remember the name of the executed. Uh, so we're gonna give him a name. Um, Uh, where's my Elred? We'll see. I wonder if one of the players remembers the name. I will ask, and then if no one has it, then I will add that name. Uh, he was an executed. He was an executed king of necromancer. What monsters would they fight? Well, the book's full of them, but it's cultist. Various types. Bugbears. Um, I'm going to be rolling for random encounters in most of these. So, I, you know, what monsters they fight is... I'm, I'm, I tend to either use random encounters what's there. I don't really... I'm, I'm going to do, go total theater of the mind uh, with this session. So I don't need to gather maps or minis at all, which means I don't have to worry about prepping my... Um, I don't have to worry about prepping any anything ahead of time. So I'm not really going to worry about what monsters they fight. We're just going to yank that section. Um, I think I'm also going to yank this fantastic locations because that's pretty that's pretty wired in. You can see how um, I'm going to close my door before the squirrels get in the house. How many squirrels in the house? <laughs> my door open so the dog can get it in and out and then the squirrels are eating food. Um, Grund is sort of like a, you know, simpleton. He follows El uh, Elmeth. <sighs> treasure. So they got screwed on treasure before uh, because they got like a wand of magic missiles and none of them are spellcaster types. So I'd like them to get something kind of nice. So I'll probably drop in a couple of items. And for this one, I am going to use, ooh, I have something um, we used last time, which is my um, game preparation stuff. And this is my workbook prototype for the, um, uh, for Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, the Lazy Dungeon Master workbook. And it has a nice item generator. So we are going to generate a, an item and see. So what do we get? We have a 13 and three, a decorated elven. I think, you know, so instead of the, um, I don't know, we'll see. So decorated elven, uh, and we're gonna make it a weapon type. That's an 11, uh, a decorated elven great sword. Ooh. Uh, and it does what? Grab our D100s here. Uh, that is an 18. Uh, that casts Shield of Faith. Hmm. That's kind of cool. I wonder who has that. Well, we'll write it down. Um, I know my wife would love that thing. Uh, so now, grab another d20. Uh, so we have a 17, a 1, and a 5. That would be a 17 is a pulsing draconic uh, crossbow. Ooh. Uh, And it it thirty one. Ooh, of acid, right? So this could be a uh, black dragon crossbow, right? Um, once a day, it can add two d six acid damage. 
a shot. That's pretty cool. Um, by the way, if you guys have any thoughts or questions or things you want to talk about that don't involve um, Shawshank Redemption, um, you know, feel free. Uh, FYI, your planning session is drawing lots of great questions from my kids. They're excited about their first game. What kind of questions do they have? I'd be, I'd be curious to know. Um, Yeah, I liked Horde of the Dragon Queen and Rise of Tiamat. We had I ran a one to twenty campaign using those, and I liked them a lot. I think that says a lot that like the fact that those uh, adventures. Oh, sorry, I need to flip flip, flip back. Um, the fact that those adventures uh, are like the lowest tier, and yet still lots of people played them and lots of people had fun. I think that actually says a lot for Watsi's adventures. Like, we can complain about them a lot, and they're they're certainly not without. Uh, um uh that they um you know they're not flawless they are flawed but i think i've i've played every one of them at least part of the way through and i tell you they're you know they're pretty great like you get you think this is a weird one for me but i think about it, like how much effort went into them like the expertise and the art and the effort and the just the the blood, sweat, and tears that went into the adventures and all the work that they did on them and then how much we pay for them. And it's like, that's a pretty tremendous value. And you think about how much time, like how much would, how long would it take you to write one of these? It'd take a year, you know, I've done it. <laughs> I haven't done one of these, but I can tell you, it'd take like a year to put one of these together. And we get it for 50 bucks or even like 30 on Amazon. Like that's tremendous amount of value. So yeah, I, I really, I think published adventures are great and I, I, I recommend them. And I, I think it's interesting that the two lowest ones were ones that I found to be great fun, and I know many people have had a lot of fun with them. So we can complain about them, but um, we still get a lot out of them. Um, so how do I feel now? This is like another part of the Lazy Dungeon Master thing. I think I mentioned this last time, which is game preparation is about how you feel, or it's about how I feel. Um, you know, everybody else can, can kind of decide. But my thought is you're prepared when you feel prepared, um, and you're probably still prepared even if you don't feel prepared. But most of the preparation that I do isn't to truly have stuff ready to run at the table. It's so I feel prepared when I sit down at the table and run it. Because that, that confidence is important in being able to improvise. And these games are all about improvisation. Um, so um, I think that there is, uh, it's, an, it's important to kind of at the end of a prep session when you hit that final one looking at it and go, does this give me enough? And I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure, right? I, like, I don't, I don't think I've got any major, major questions. I know what's going to happen. I like the bugbears and the pirates. You know, I like kind of all the secrets are good. Um, I'm hoping to do a little bit more sort of mystery. I might probably go back and read more about the characters in uh, Red Lark, you know, that there's these people at Red Lark. I think I'm, you know, I'm going to simplify this because this, you know, and we're just going to have the Believers and uh, Ilmeth, Whalever. And they've met Ilmeth before, but they haven't met anybody else. So the fact that, um, you know, the fact that there are other members of uh, the Cult of Black Earth, um, I don't think we're going to worry too much about that. Uh, you know, it's just like they, they're just not spending a lot of time in Red Lark. And, um, I think we just want to get them on the road and get them to the thing because, again, running running a 256-page adventure in 12 sessions uh, means things have to move. Um, so, anyway, um, any other questions you guys have? Anything else you want to bring up? Uh, can you make up just anybody? Are the monks like ninjas? Can they fly on griffins? Yes. The players can definitely fly on griffins. There's a whole section about flying on griffins, which is fun, and it's also kind of fun because the people you're you're you're, you're it's like playing polo with these guys on griffins. They're chasing after a uh, manticore, um, but the reality is that the other griffin riders are actually secret members of a cult, so they're going to go after the players and try to dismount them. Um, when I ran this last time, we had one of my favorite things, which was a character who was riding on top of the manticore and repeatedly hacking the manticore with his greatsword. And they said, what's, what are you going to do if you kill the manticore? You're at like a, you're 150 feet up. 
And he says, that's a problem for six seconds from now. And I have used that, um, you know. Uh, I think they say, Sly fought the good fight and the Twitch chat let him be, I guess. Um, yeah, shoots bolts through a carved dragon mouth, I think is very cool. I, the idea that's like a black dragon looking crossbow and it fires an acid bolt, you know, that you know, like the dragon on the crossbow breathes, I think. That's why I really like making these sort of custom magic items rather than just your flat, your flat things. Um, you know, like the fact that it adds 2d6 damage once a day is not unbalancing at all, but players, it's like, ooh, that's a cool thing. I'm going to use that. Um, you know, same, they have decorated elven greatsword that casts shields of faith once a day. And that one might grow, you know, the idea of this elven greatsword. I think it might, I think I'm going to go with a dwarven, Thessalmere dwarven, right? So I'm changing the vessel, the, the elven greatsword to a dwarven greatsword. Um, are they like ninjas? Yeah, they are. They're like monks. So yeah, they don't dress like ninjas. Um, but, uh, yeah. Uh, is there anything I'm missing? I think that's pretty good. I don't know where they're going to go. So I'm, I'm giving them lots of options. Are they going to go to Feathergale? Are they going to go to, you know, Womford? Uh, are they going to go to, uh, investigate the Circle of the Scarlet Moon? Um, yeah, um, I'm glad you like that table. Uh, it should be a lot of fun. So Scott Gray and I are going to be working on the development of it along with, and then and Mark Radel is going to be working on the design. Uh, I'll show you some more stuff from it if you want to see it. Let me jump over. Uh, whoops. Hang on. Um, so it, this is the whole checklist for all the stuff that's in the Lazy Dungeon Master book uh, in the new one, in Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. So it's sort of just like, you know, you've read the book already, but you just want to kind of review it or you haven't played in a little bit and you just want to go like, what are all the things? This is just sort of the mantras of it. You know, what are all the aspects? It's really like all the chapter headings that are in there and what you should do. And, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. Uh, there's a little piece of art. Um, uh, Pedro Patier is doing all the internal art. And that's like one of the examples. I've got some other ones. So then this is sort of a two page spread. This is the, like, you know, the Sly Flourish version of the Dungeon Master's Guide or the Dungeon Master screen, the things that I would like in there. And, you know, I always forget what the skills are and uh, improvised statistics or something people really like. Uh, quick encounter building, you know, I think it's important to, to, to understand what the balance, you know, like, can you look at a battle and see if it's deadly is really what encounter building is about. Uh, expected targets and area effect. This is really good for... Um, uh, running narrative combat, you know, if I do a fireball, how many people should I expect to get hit in the fireball? Large numbers of monsters. I love this one because now I can run a hundred skeletons against people uh, in exhaustion. And then conditions, or you got to have conditions. No one remembers them. This is a nice full set. And then I love the madness effects. I use madness all the time. So uh, I put madness on here because to me, it's one of the most flavorful conditions you can apply to a character. It's got a lot of role play potential. So people are like, wow, that's a lot of space used for madness, but I couldn't find anything else that I liked. Uh, name generator, I got a whole bunch of first names. I got a whole bunch of second, you know, surnames. And then I've got a generator for surnames. And you can use these to do uh, inns, or they don't have to be for people. They can be for um, places. So, you know, if you have a bar, um, 42 is the gray, uh, and 14, um, the gray bottom bar. Hmm. That doesn't sound so good. How about the gray blood bar? Um, or you can, I think you could roll, actually, let's do that. The gray crow, the gray dawn, right? Oh, that's a great name. So you could use the first part twice, right? 32 and 72. 32 is the gentle and 72 is the riddle. The gentle riddle. Hmm, that's an interesting joint. That sounds like a, you know, beatnik. Beatniks would go there. Uh, traps. So this is similar to the um, uh, the items. You can you have an element and a physical trap and a trigger. So you could say, and you can roll a couple of times on this. So you you can have like one big trap that's actually two of these. So we're gonna roll four d twenty to generate a really ass kicking trap. Yeah, the hip. It's a hipster club. That's right. Uh, eight, one, seven, and four. Uh, eight and one. So you have forceful bolts uh, and lightning 
uh, lightning bolos from one trap, right? And it's triggered uh, by a idol on a pedestal. And there's an idol, idol on a pedestal. If you touch it, um, you know, what did I say? Lightning bolts? Or lightning, lightning bolos and thunders. Yeah, I don't know. Boy, you know, you could do a lot with it. And then right on here, it tells you, like, what are the, how deadly, how dangerous are they and how much damage do they do? Um, so that's that's pretty handy. Uh, items we showed. So this one actually, you know, I, I generated magic items for it, but you can also generate, like, single, single use items. So you could have, um, I, I always like this for, um, uh, yeah, actually, so the magic missiles, right? The stitched, you're exactly right. You don't have to use anything off of these charts directly. Instead, they inspire you. I never would have thought of a black dragon crossed by the fire's acid, but I rolled and I got some things and I'm like, hey, these kind of make sense. So, you know, these these are really nice. But um, uh, maddening glyphs on a child's story. Exactly, right? I love that stuff. Random charts are huge. I wrote a whole article on Sly Flourish about the importance of random charts. And what I did here is I tried to have cascading random charts. So like, if you look at that trap one, I figured, I, I can't remember what the calculated number is, but the, it's a tremendous number of potential traps that you can generate with that. Way bigger than just a single table. Um, so this one, you can have uh, single use magic items, like a trinket, uh, which are kind of cool. So you would still roll a pair of d20. Uh, you would have 13 and four. So you have a decorated primeval, um, I'm liking this already. I like primeval things, as you know. Um, decorated primeval hammer that casts uh, 75, that casts haste. That's weird. Or we could just jump on ahead and go thunderbolt or lightning bolt, right? So there's a primeval hammer and it's got one charge of lightning bolt in it. Um, you know, that's kind of a neat sort of, you know, I'm writing that one down, right? Oh, that one was so good. Uh, what was it? I don't remember what the first part was. Uh, but the idea that this item could have been from the depths, from from the, the the place that's even below the fane, right? The elemental, the fane of the elemental eye. Uh, Eighteen. A glowing primeval hammer. Perfect. Um, yeah, everyone. So, uh, A, uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name. S. Tochasm42. No one's good at coming up with stuff like this. Right? No one can just, that's why I wrote Fantastic Locations, is like, I suck at coming up with Fantastic Locations. We suck at this stuff. But if we can generate them, if we can use random things. So let me, I, I just spent a lot of time on this. Uh, ancient Monuments. So this is that fantastic place, right? You want a, so it's 3D20 plus 1D100. Right? So we have 6, 1, uh, 50, and 15. Uh, six is a ruined draconic uh, meteorite. Ruined, ruined or ruined? Uh, six is ruined draconic meteorite uh, of love. <laughs> ruined draconic meteorite. I'm not doing of love. Sorry. I mean, one could if that if that's what you enjoy, but uh, of acid, right? Hey, look, another, ooh, a ruined draconic meteorite of acid. And you crack it open, and inside is a crazy crossbow, like an egg with a crossbow inside. That's a little weird. But, um, yeah, so, like, you know, you, you imagine you're out walking in the, in the woods, and there's a meteorite there, and it looks like it's been there forever, but it's cracked, and acid is coming out of it. And, ooh, I like this, right? So this took away, I took away my fantastic locations. Uh, I'm going to make it a ruined instead of ruined. Um, so that ancient monuments is a really great way. Um, it's a really great way to add something into the middle of an encounter. So it's sort of like you want a scene if they're exploring, 
roll on this thing, come up with it, write it down. And, and probably for the ancient monuments, it's worth doing in prep because you don't want to really be hammering this out during anything. Um, just going through the rest of the book. Uh, and quick encounter building, I really wanted to have a quick like, hey, what are you supposed to do? Choose the type of number of monsters based on the situation of the story. Don't worry about what your group is like, what makes sense. Then determine whether the encounter is deadly. And you can determine if it's deadly by comparing the number of monsters to the number of characters and what the challenge rating of the monster is compared to the character's level. And there's a whole chart here. It is not easy, but it's as easy as it can be. Um, and then I have a one page summary of how to run narrative theater of the, com theater of the mind combat, uh, because I am a, I'm a believer in it. Uh, I, I don't know if any of you bothered looking at anything on that I was writing on Twitter yesterday, but I was on sort of a rant about miniatures because I, I have experimented with, this is, uh, so DM Rocketeer, this is the workbook, the Lazy Dungeon Master workbook. So this is the second, there's two books that are coming out as part of Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. The first one is a advice book. And it has a full description of to do the, how, to, how to do game prep the way I did it, how to think about our games, uh, lots of data from different surveys and things on where we go. But this one is the workbook, which is going to be like a 32-page book that you carry around in your DM kit, and it gives you all these references in it. And this is just part of it. The other part of it is going to be 10 maps of common locations and descriptions. So... If your group decides to go one level deeper in a dungeon and you're like, hmm, I wonder what that is. Is it a catacombs? If it's a catacombs, you have a catacombs and you can read it and it works really well. Um, good counter table stuffed in my monster line. Yeah. So um, this is, I think you're right. I think this book is going to rock. This is what I'm spending a lot of my time on these days because the book, the rest of the book is currently being edited by Scott Gray. Um, so I'm not doing anything with that. But the artwork is coming in. It's going to be great. And this will be, I think the PDF of this will be five bucks. Um, and the uh, and then you can kind of print whatever pages you want and stick them in a screen. They are not going to be combined. They're going to be two separate books. Um, the package deal was part of the Kickstarter, but it won't be, it's not going to be expensive. Because um, the, the main book's only eight, right? So this is not another Kickstarter. This is the stretch goal. The Kickstarter did tremendously well. And all of the... Uh, a lot of it is going to be going into um, a lot of the, you know, what we, a lot of the stretch goals were into this because the book was the book. The book was already done. Um, but so this is the second book. But you can buy them, I think, together in PDF, they'll be 13 bucks. And then I'm not sure what they are in print, about five bucks more each. So I think it'll be $10 for this in print and about maybe $15 for return in print, something like that. So. Anyway, I am 10 minutes over my allotted time. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for the wonderful chat. I hope you uh, found some interesting stuff. I will probably do this again next week. Um, and for any of you folks that saw this on YouTube, thank you for watching it on YouTube. Lazy Dungeon Master's Lost Notes. But they won't be lost because you can, you can have them too. Thank you, guys. Keep, keep rolling those 20s.